we're just really delighted to have Dr. Oliver Smithies here. Um, he, he's an interesting person to talk to, whether you're talking about gene targeting or flying or any of his other interests. And so you always have a great way of putting what you're doing into a context, I think, that's meaningful to all the rest of us, whether we're in your discipline or not. So thank you so much for coming and sharing some time with us today. And we're also really pleased to have Tony Waldrop here to uh, play the role of moderator and chief conversationalist. <laughs> I didn't tell you that was part of the role, but <laughs> I'm sure that, that that'll come easily to you. Um, of course, Dr. Smithies is world-renowned as a Nobel Prize recipient uh, in 2007. He's been a uh, eminent, let's see, I have to read this right, excellence professor of patho pathology and laboratory medicine here at UNC since 1988, has published over 300 recent articles and won numerous honors and prizes on his way to receiving the Nobel Prize in physiology or medicine in 2007. And if you haven't had a chance to look at any of the clips of his Nobel acceptance speech or his lecture, um, I really recommend that you do that. They're very entertaining. There are various ways to get to those, one of which is from our own library's website. So dip into that and enjoy it, as I'm sure you will. Um, Tony Waldrop is also world renowned <laughs> in his own way. Uh, having won the world record for the uh, indoor mile in 1970, in the mid-1970s, we'll say. Yeah, let's not say how long. We won't say exactly, <laughs> mid-1970s. And then gave that up to pursue a career in science, so aren't we glad about that? Um, Tony rejoined us being a North Carolina native son in 2001 as Vice Chancellor for Research and Economic Development. So. Tony and Oliver are friends and colleagues and speak the same language, although in slightly different disciplines. And so um, we're just really looking forward to what you have to share with us today. And those of us who are in the library and information business in this room have a particular interest in hearing what you have to say. We, we know that so many things have changed in science and in information in the last decade or so that we think it's really important for us to be able to understand how those changes are impacting the way science is done, such as I'm looking with great interest at the various formats of information that you have displayed on the table here, and that's definitely one of those changes. So we know that we have a lot to learn from hearing your comments and observations and hope that it will be an interactive session. So let's get going. Well, let me just say what an honor it is to be able to set up here with with uh, Oliver Smithies, uh, as Carol introduced him, he certainly is world renowned, was world renowned long before the Nobel Prize, but even more so now. The thing that most impresses me about him is obviously the science that he's done and the impact that he's had on his field, but that he is such a genuinely nice individual and he is so willing to go and talk with whatever group that uh, might seek to have him in front of them. I know that he's here today. I, I believe you have a an interaction with a high school later this week or next week one and has is I would encourage you when we get to the point of taking questions uh, and in particular the students to ask whatever question you might have I would second what Carol said as far as going and looking at his Nobel address he specifically addresses students in that and Oliver I watched that clip on the web and had, saw you looking up in the balcony where a lot of the students must have been and so it was important the it's also amazing, those of you who have heard him talk before, to get his perspective of how things have changed over time. And he's going to, to share some of that with us today. And Oliver, if we, if we could, just get started by you talking some about record keeping and data preservation and how that has changed over your career. And I know some of the props mm -hmm. will enter into that discussion. So let me turn it over to you. Well, I think maybe I'll start at the level that the students will recognize how you learn something. Great. Uh, I was very lucky and I'm fortunate, perhaps is a better word to use, uh, to have been a student in, uh, in Oxford University. Um, in, uh, I was a scholar. There, there was there was various levels of... of 
scholastic uh, fame, as it were. You were a scholar, or you were an exhibitioner, or you were a student. And I was a scholar, uh, which meant I won a scholarship um, from a, a, a small town in the north of England, uh, where they, where I went to school uh, as a, uh, in the early days until I was eleven at a little village school that uh, is still there. But uh, the way of teaching in, in Oxford is is a very good way, and uh, uh, I think it's something I've tried to use later on in in universities here in the United States and. Primarily, the teaching is done through reading the original literature. That's to say, you, you're given a topic uh, to write a, write, write a weekly essay on by your tutor, who may be a man or a woman, uh, depends, just the tutor uh, associated with your college. And uh, the, it might be very vague, it might be a topic like, Write me an essay on pain. That's all you were told. And, then, and now you've got to go and read about pain. And uh, so you can spend maybe a day reading the textbooks and maybe a couple of days reading reviews. And then after that, you were expected to go and read the original literature. That's to say, by the original literature, I mean the primary publication. And uh, it, it was always uh, fr rather frustrating that uh, you, you had to go to the library and look for the journal that you wanted and look for the particular issue. And uh, the chances are somebody else had it out anyway, and then <laughs> you would have to go back. And so there was a continuous sort of fight about finding uh, where books were and so on. But nonetheless, uh, that method of teaching, of, of getting people to read the original work, is vital, I think, to real schol uh, scholastic uh, ability and uh, understanding a subject. If you read only what has been distilled by somebody else, you don't have to go through the process of, of uh, uh, extracting the important information. And it's interesting to me that if you go back to the very first publications on, on various topics, you often find that they're quite simple. That, um, For example, I, uh, the one I was thinking of that I showed the other day when talking to uh, some students in, uh, in, uh, in not, not Central University, but anyway, in the National Institutes of Science, which is, which is a, a, a collection of uh, colleges uh, of historically black colleges, a society associated with them. And I was talking to them about sickle cell anemia, because of course that's something that concerns black uh, kids. And uh, uh, I showed them the original paper, and it, it was 1910, and anybody could understand it. In slightly garbled language, it says the peculiar sickle cell shaped erythrocytes in a person with anemia. And, and that really is the whole of the message of that paper. And any person can get that message, and you can get the excitement by going back to that of understanding what w was going through the mind of the person who first saw that. And as you go through the different parts of science, you can find that true of many. For example, um, I mean, all of you know about Watson and Crick. How many of you have read his original paper? Two of you, three maybe. You know that paper is only one page long. <laughs> only one page. And you can read it, and it's not difficult to read, and out of it you can extract what was their genius, because they were, uh, they were genii, if that's the right plural for genius, um, because they uh, recognized um, how di the different const uh, parts of, the, of DNA fit together. 
they, they published it as a double helix, which it was, but that really wasn't important. The important part was learning that uh, basis paired, and that's in two sentences in that paper, and you can read it and you can understand it. They were not very modest men. <laughs> <laughs> One of them is still alive, the other is not. I've known both of them. And, um, because they ended up, uh, in a, I always think uh, uh, this ought to be said in a snooty accent, it has not escaped our notice uh, that our model will explain the replication of DNA. Or words to that effect. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, and that's all they said about it. And it's a throwaway sentence showing what it is. But it's so enjoyable to go and read that in the original. Now, you, couldn't, you can't do that easily with the ordinary sort of library. Uh, but you can now, you see. Because uh, you can go on PubMed or other forms of uh, even Google. And you can be directed to original literature. And you can get a PDF that you can read of the actual words and the actual paper that is uh, describing something of interest to you. And in that way, you can learn a lot more, a lot faster than it used to be possible. And I was thinking about my own experience of, uh, of learning in this respect. And about oh, um, a couple of years ago, I had an idea about how the kidney might work. And I'd never studied the kidney particularly, and I hadn't any training in that area. But you know, in, in three months, you could get yourself completely immersed in that topic because you could work your way back through the literature. It isn't yet good enough to go all the way back, but it's getting better all the time. And I think uh, library scientists have to think about that particularly, about it's an opportunity for all of us to read all of the literature, not just the last two years or the last, uh, it used to be, maybe it got uh, better with PubMed, went back about uh, uh, six years, 10 years, and now you can get back much further. So that's a very important thing. But we have to teach people how to use that information. They shouldn't just go and skim the, uh, the, f the current uh, PowerPoint presentation uh, of what it is. They, we should teach to go back because it, it's in the fine print that you really understand what's going on. It's not in the, in the title of a paper is a, the, the grossest exaggeration that the authors could get away with. <laughs> and, and the abstract uh, uh, tries not to say any of the problems. <laughs> and uh, and then you have to read in the paper, and then you can maybe deduce, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, um, well, how do you handle all that information? Well, uh, there's a storage system up here. It's plant senescence in it. Uh, it won't last more than, well, I don't know, maybe if some people are lucky, it lasts Eight years. Mine has lasted eight years, and uh, it's still going. But it, it's, it won't, won't last forever. So we have to get that information down somewhere. And I, I thought it was interesting to look at, uh, at, uh, at how that was. And, I, and so I brought some of the things that were in my history, as it were. Uh, and this, is, this was a pretty important part of the storage system uh, at one stage of my life. And, I don't know how many of you recognize it, but it's a teletype uh, tape. And uh, I, I, uh, my first computer program was written with a teletype using a time-sharing computer in, that was 60 miles away. Our university in Wisconsin didn't have a time-sharing computer, but there was one uh, that General Electric had in uh, Milwaukee, about 60 miles away, and you could communicate with them with teletype. So it, was, it really was good interaction. You could actually get an answer 
within reasonable time instead of feeding cards into an IBM computer and going back next day and finding, as Nvuya will tell me, has told me uh, that used to happen to her, I'm finding a mistake on the first card. And so all the rest were useless. Um, but uh, so that's a big advance. But it, uh, uh, you can't read this anymore. I don't think there's anybody has a piece of equipment uh, in amongst us who could read it. And then, and then it got a bit better because it, it went into this sort of thing, you know. And, and this was a fairly advanced one, you see. So, and so that was computer memory. I can't read this. <laughs> Um, so, okay, well, what, what's going on then now? Who has a floppy disk? Who has any floppy disks anymore? <laughs> well, you have a few. <laughs> can you read them? <laughs> you can't read them anymore. These were, uh, you can, these were the greatest thing, you know. You're going to have all of your knowledge and all of your information on, on these things. It got a bit better. It, it, then it got to these, didn't it? These are the CDs. And... Uh, and uh, I don't think those are, it's getting so fewer and fewer computers can even read these. And, uh, well, what about these? Oh, they're the cat's whiskers. <laughs> <laughs> They'll be out, uh, uh, ten years from now, you won't be able to read this. You won't have a machine that will read it. It will use something like this. Because this one, and even this will be out of date, and this one is now, now this particular one is... Uh, Two gigabytes of information. Two gigabytes. I don't even remember how many zeros there are to get to a gig gigabyte. So they're all going to go out of date, is my message to you. So how are you going to have a record that you can still use for a long time? And I think you have to still think about the old method of pen and ink or paper anyway and I realize I could exemplify it by 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 this and it com it goes also into library science because this is, says OS planning notes and the de date on it is 1953 so that that's 55 years old and you can see how I had to learn at that time because it, it goes through Chemical abstracts and quarterly cumulative medical in index. <laughs> That's all you could do. That was already, it was a library tool because you could go to the library and you could get this big book, but these big books, there were many of them, which were chemical abstracts, and you could get this quarterly, as it obviously is quarterly, cumulative medical in uh, uh, index. And, and my first job was I was hired by a, 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 a grand person, David Scott, and he, he was, as I thought at the time, rather ancient. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I would think he was rather young <laughs> now. But anyway, uh, he had been uh, one of the uh, people working in the early days of insulin. Uh, insulin was discovered, as uh, some of you know, in Toronto in the 1920s by Banting and Bess. And David Scott uh, crystallized uh, insulin, it's a protein, and crystallized it uh, in the form of zinc insulin. And it was very slowly dissolving, and it's still used to this day as uh, a slow-release insulin. And so when I went to ask him for a job, he said, well, you can work on anything you like, Dr. Smithers, as long as it has something to do with insulin. So you see, my note says, quote, insulin. <laughs> so that was the whole, that was the scanning that I was looking at, all of the articles which had insulin in them. And you can see, if you can read, this is, in 1945, I found 2144 superscript 4, P1023 superscript 4. I have no idea what the superscripts mean. <laughs> um, but the, most of those are crossed out. And then, the, then about the fifth down is 1430 superscript 7 with a check mark on it. And this has now got the title written in it. Uh, statistics of assay, extended crossover design and its use in insulin assays. K.W. Smith at our quarterly journal of 
of um, uh, pharmacology, pharmacology, etc., etc., 1944. So you see now I've got a, a reference, but it goes on all the way through these, and you can see that some of them I even wrote out a bit more. Here I've got one. And it, and, and it sort of gives the abstract. And there's pages and pages of this stuff. And that's what you had to do to try to find your way around. But how many of you would be able to produce a record that's 55 years old that shows you what had happened only by writing it on something that will last? And so uh, it's interesting because it actually goes into... It runs immediately into this, this which is falling apart, you see. <laughs> but this is my lab record book from my first job. And it starts with O. Smith is room 327, School of Hygiene Building, College Street, Toronto, October 1953. You see, so it follows directly from that. And in here, you'll find me trying to work with insulin. And, and there's a page which I used in my Nobel lecture of, of that shows that I was having trouble uh, with, with it, etc. But here's a record, isn't it? And it still exists, and it's 50 odd years old. And, and you can go on, and then you can trace, and you can see this one, and th th this one I like because this was the first time I found a genetic difference in anybody. That was a difference in in the serum proteins of a, I thought it was a male-female difference because this was the first female I'd looked at. Uh, but it wasn't. It was <laughs> inherited. But uh, there it is, and it's drawn in there because it didn't have a camera. So I couldn't have recorded it any other way. But anyway, it goes on like that. And, and then I think this is an interesting one because this is now much more recent. And um, th this one's now in 1982. And this page has my first... Uh, uh, ideas on on uh, how to do gene targeting. And it's all on this one page, you see. And you can still see it. So you can see, and you can look back and you can see what was going on in Smithers' head before. The page before has nothing to do with it. It's a new, a new thought and, and what happens then and what you have to do and, and so on. And, and maybe, and then here, three years later is one Still, I, you see, I still enjoy them. Uh, three, years, <laughs> three years later is the time when it worked. Three years and one month. See Gamma 13, because that was Gamma, the book Gamma. And uh, I, I'd gone through the alpha, I'd gone through the Roman numerals up to about 30. I'd gone through the capital letters, I'd gone through the small letters, I'd gone through the Greek letters. <laughs> And, and then I, I'm now back on the uh, ordinary letters with prime numbers, so I can uh, <laughs> I can use primes, and and so on. It goes on, and then where's the, what's this one? Well, this one says Monday, March the thirtieth. What day is it today? Monday, March the thirtieth. DTT to GSH injection. And it checks for one milliliter of gold chloride, four milliliters of distilled water, 3.8 milliliters of water containing 25 milligrams of DDT. And so it's my notebook still. And, uh, and then somebody could, and that was 9.52 a.m. And, and I was trying to do the experiment in a, uh, in a timed manner. And at 10 a.m. Uh, I gave this fraction uh, injected by Mike, that's my postdoc. And he's, we're going to see if making the, things fast will work. But these records are very critical. So somehow you people in information science have to bridge the gap between these which won't last and these which will last. And you've got to teach people to use both, not just one. And I think that's an important thought because, you know, otherwise you're going to have happened what, what I've happened here, you see. This is the last, well, actually one before the last because I've saved the last, the last issue of Christian Science Monitor in this form. It will not be available in paper form anymore. And this is our local newspaper. It's uh, the nice one that is talking about the blue devils coming up short. <laughs> 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 
So it's a very good page, but you see, it's already, it's already shrunk into nothingness, hasn't it? And this won't, I'll bet you two years from now you won't get this anymore. So that's the problem of information science that you have to think about. Okay, well, I've spoken enough now, so somebody else can talk. Uh, not nearly <laughs> enough, but I, I have a few questions, and then certainly I know others do. Uh, Oliver, we talked some uh, prior to starting today about how your use of the library has changed over time and changes that have been made in the library. Would you be willing to say a few things about what it was like when you started? Well, and, and yes, how you I, I told you about what you had to do as students, and then occasionally you would, uh, and so you'd read a lot of things, mm -hmm. and occasionally you might even, there was one that I thought was marvelous when in this lecture, actually this essay on pain, because I came across the fact that somebody had had the idea that there'd been <coughs> protopathic organism which could uh, uh, detect pain and not much else and an epi epicritic organism which could distinguish all sorts of fine things and and that this is the way evolution had gone and uh, I learned the I learned the one sentence I thought it was marvelous because it was one sentence and it goes talking about the protopathic animal this creature if it could propagate its bewildered kind, which appears doubtful, could have little survival value. For in response to a stimulus which it could not understand, from a stimulating agent whose nature it had no means of determining, could only respond by curling up and micturating. <laughs> <laughs> which, uh, for those who don't know, is peeing. <laughs> But that's, that's in this form of memory. But anyway, uh, so, that, had, that was... So, so you've had a library. long interest in the kidney all the way back to that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, um, I, I mentioned going to the library, and, um, and the library has... Uh, it's always been an, a critical part of, of scholastic endeavors, and, uh, and I'm sure we go back to the famous libraries that you can find all over the world. And that tells us how important they've been. Then, the, but the library is a practical tool, in a sense, and then uh, you have to learn how to use it. And initially, it was go to the library and and look for the journals. Then it was helped by cumulative index. Mm -hmm. And then, as you think, it, uh, the, uh, PubMed was an enormous advance because then you could have the uh, title and you could have an abstract and at least you could know which one was worth going to look for. You couldn't see the whole thing yet. You would have to go to the library to see the whole thing. Uh, but uh, you would know what you were going to look for, so that would help a lot. Uh, and, and now, as I say, we can, uh, we can do much better than that because well, perhaps about two, a third to, to two thirds of the of the papers that you want to read, there is uh, a full copy available. Mm -hmm. Not far back yet, and the search engine for PubMed is a very poor search engine, in my opinion. In fact, I don't think there is a really good library search engine because <coughs> there's one for chemicals called SciFinder. And that uh, helps you with the chemical literature, but uh, they're really rather poor. And I, I can exemplify that, and some of you can. I'm sure that you know you have a reference in front of you, and you search with the terms in that reference, and it doesn't come up. So that tells you that it, that they are not adequate yet. But they're improving so much, and you can learn so much, so much faster. I have to tell you another anecdote. Well, it's a true story. It's not an anecdote. It's, it's what happened. Uh, about a year ago now, they had uh, an affair in uh, New York where they unveiled some uh, places where the Nobel laureates' names were inscribed, and it was associated with the Swedish embassy. And the Swedish embassy or, or the Nobel Foundation, I don't remember which, had asked students to write an essay about uh, about some topic of their own choosing and submit it as in a competition. And a young uh, woman, uh, I would say a, a girl really, she was only 16, um, uh, won this competition uh, for an essay on uh, Niels Bohr. And, uh, and uh, I got to read her essay. 
And it was almost exactly the same essay that I'd written when I was 23, uh, when my uh, uh, topic for the week was discuss the Powley exclusion principle and the periodic table. That was your essay. And the Pauli exclusion principle is to do with quantum uh, numbers that electrons can have and that you can't have two electrons with the same quantum numbers, etc. And this led to the, a marvellous uh, understanding of the periodic table. And so I, asked, I said, I wonder if this girl now, is she a lot smarter than I was? Or what, what? And then I came to the conclusion that we were about equal and that it was now a lot easier to learn, so you could learn sooner. And that the difference was that she could get this information at an earlier age, and that we were probably equal <laughs> in, in that respect. I might, I might add a, another story about that essay, because I, oh, I had a glorious time writing it, and she had with hers. They, we, we both enjoyed the topic so much, it's a glorious topic. And it's very, it seems very sophisticated, and it isn't really. But anyway, I got about halfway down the first page. I had 12 pages reading this to my tutor. And he, and he found something that I couldn't justify, and I didn't really understand. And the rest of that tutorial, they lasted about an hour, was teaching you that you never, ever write down something that you don't understand and that you can't just justify. Mm -hmm. A marvelous lesson. But anyway, going back to this topic of the library, you can see what I'm saying. It's a lot easier now. There's a lot more information, but it's a lot easier to get it. There's no excuse for not going back in the literature anymore. Absolutely. So, so something that libraries have pushed for and something we're seeing throughout the country now is the open sharing of data as soon as it's put into publications. And I wonder if you might talk some about what impact that's had on science over the years, the availability uh, uh, of being uh, able to do this rapidly. On my, on my information of science, it's not done well, is the simple answer. It's not really practical to put data directly into a computer, at least our sort of data because it's not in a handleable form and, they, and you have to hire a person who tries to put it into mm -hmm. a handleable form and by then it's become passe or whatever and it's not really terribly useful, I don't think, at the moment in the form we've been exposed to. I'm, I suppose that's partly showing my age, but uh, I, don't, I haven't found it helpful. Um, but, but if you go to the next step and look at papers once they're accepted for publication. That's a different matter because then, then it's already been digested mm -hmm. and it's in a form you can read. And then the supplementary material particularly is extremely valuable because that can have all of the primary data or a much bigger pro mm -hmm. proportion of the primary data. Those are absolutely invaluable. That's completely different from this putting in data as you exactly. raw data. It's not much use to people in most of the situations because it's too personal, most of it. Uh, I mean, the, the, the method of writing it down or the experiment, and the, it takes too much time to do it. Some people have pushed back some on open access, and, and they've worried that if, if the articles are published too soon, other people will get their ideas and be able to quickly replicate those before publication. There are many of us who don't accept that, but I'd be interested to hear from you as, as far as your thoughts. Well, I, I've always thought that I, I, anybody who came into my lab could hear what I'm doing and can hear what I'm thinking. I mean, that's part of science, and I'll take the that's chance that they'll steal it. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I think one time in, uh, ten, nine times after 10, you will have great enjoyment in talking to other people and just communicating freely. Maybe one time in 10 you might be burned a little bit, but I think it's even less than that. And if you cut off that, you've t thrown away nine-tenths of your enjoyment. Uh, it isn't worth it. It isn't worth being secretive about <coughs> things. Uh, but I, I realize that that's a, uh, an ivory tower sort of view because if you're in, if you're in a commercial operation and you have to patent something, you obviously don't, can't go around talking about it all the time. I've never had difficulty in, the, in what you would call competitive science. I've always 
try to avoid it. If, I, um, if I've got in that situation, I've tried to get out of that field of, of endeavor. It's not pleasant. I don't enjoy it particularly. I've won competitions of that type, and then I've been glad to leave it. There was one with, that occurred while I was here, and that, that was at the time cystic fibrosis gene was first identified. There was a lot of competition in trying to be the first to knock that gene out. I, and uh, it wasn't very pleasant. And Beth Kohler, who's a professor here now, and she and I both agreed that it wasn't really a pleasant time f for us with that sort of competitive atmosphere. And uh, though we, won in a sense, won the competition because we got the first one, but we neither of us enjoyed it much and were glad to be out of it. And so it's not the way to do science. Oh, and I agree with you very much. An additional part of sharing of the information is that not only has it made it easier for students to learn and for scientists to share information, but I think the general public also has a thirst for getting information sooner than what we used to see before. And I'd be interested to hear your thoughts about that and how important it is to get that information out to the lay public? Well, I think uh, it's, a, uh, it's a duty of scientists to make sure that, they, that the p people who are, after all, funding them, the ordinary, per the ordinary public is paying for the science which we do, that we can talk to people about it. And I, d I don't know what the best way to do it is. I, I've been trying to do my little bit, as it were, um, since the Nobel prize was awarded because people <laughs> want to hear me talk. I don't talk any better than I did before or any more <laughs> wisely than I did before. But for some reason, people want to hear it now. <laughs> and, um, uh, but, it, but it is a challenge and uh, an enjoyable challenge to talk to people so that they can understand. And I found that business of I was talking about original papers. I will go and talk to a lay audience and I will use the original papers and show them that they can, with translation, understand what the primary information was, not some, uh, my bête noire, not some PowerPoint uh, distillation of it. Mm -hmm. So I enjoy that, but I, I don't know uh, how the speed of that relates, in a sense, to communicating. It isn't really speed, it's the ability to talk to a person without using long words, if you can use short ones. And that's something that we have to learn to do. Mm -hmm. I'm going to turn open up the questions to the audience in just a moment, but what if you had a student come to you today or tomorrow, and they said, what's the best piece of advice you can give me as I'm beginning my training in science? What oh, would you tell them? Oh, I would say, look around for something that you enjoy doing. That's the primary thing. If you don't enjoy it, you won't ever do very well. And I, and I say to students that, uh, and I use my own career as an example. I, I say, I'd, I'd, my PhD was uh, involved uh, wasn't originally set out to do this, but it involved designing and building uh, a, a relatively complicated, complicated piece of apparatus to measure osmotic pressures. And it was a good piece of machinery in the end, apparatus, not machinery, and it was very precise and so precise that I had to interrupt my theoretical line to let my points show because they would be covered by the line. And I pointed out that uh, Nobody ever quoted that paper, and nobody ever used that machine. I didn't use it again, and so what was it? It was, what did it achieve? Well, it, in doing it, I learned how to do science, and that's what it was about. It didn't matter uh, what it was, really. I'd learned how to do science. It didn't have any contribution to the future of mankind or womankind. Um, <laughs> But I enjoyed doing it. I had a, a very good time. And, and later on, as, as I mean, I wouldn't be doing experimental science if I didn't enjoy it. I go to the lab at the weekends. I don't go to work. 
I go to play. <laughs> I mean, I get paid for playing. So if you're a student and you find yourself doing something that you don't like, go to your advisor and ask for a change. If you don't like looking down the microscope, you shouldn't be looking down the microscope two or three hours a day. If you don't like handling mice, you shouldn't be working with mice. You, you may have to work with mice that you don't really, which isn't your favorite part of the day. <laughs> but uh, uh, anyway, what I'm generally saying is fi find something that you like doing every day. Not every day, but every day. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and then if, you, if your advisor won't help you change, there is another solution. Change your advisor. <laughs> I've said that before, but it's, I mean it seriously. That, that that's the single most important thing, is to find something that you enjoy doing and do it well. And, and I'm going to share something you told me before uh, we came up here and started this session. I'd ask Oliver what was one of the funnest things or one of the biggest benefits of getting the Nobel Prize here on this campus. And would you like to tell them what it was? Well, the, the funnest. Right. The, you said the funnest. The funnest. 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 Okay. The, the, what was the most fun? Well, it was when our old, uh, our old chancellor um, uh, got up at the, uh, I think it was faculty day, he, he'd introduced me to the faculty earlier on, and then later on in the course of it, he sort of deadpan and, uh, and got up and said, now I'm going to um, take a pri privilege which uh, a chancellors can have, and I'm going to uh, say that Smithies has a, f a free parking place for the rest of his life. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was the funniest thing. <laughs> because <laughs> I did this. <laughs> uh, because uh, it, it's actually very useful. <laughs> I, can, I know where I can go. Occasionally I have to take a piece of paper out of my... Uh, we uh, we made, made a few cards of this that says, you have parked in a place that is reserved for somebody else. Would you please move your car? <laughs> We've had to use that a few times, but not very often, actually. It's honoured very well, but that's the funnest thing that happened. And then I got to go to the final four last year, because <laughs> <laughs> uh, I said, uh, because that, w but that was another story I should tell you since we're telling stories. Um, uh, he called me up about a couple of weeks later after this incident, and then said, uh, uh, by then he called me Oliver. He said, Oliver, I I'd like to ask you a favor of you. And I said, oh, what's that? I said, I'll do my best, Chancellor. He said, well, I'd like you to have your photograph taken in a UNC basketball jersey. I said, what? And he said, yes, I want to have an ad in the New York Times showing that UNC is not only good at basketball. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so eventually got this uh, for photograph. Then some of you have probably seen it with me holding a basketball. I never held a basketball in my life before. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and they even changed the number to 50. And those of you who know basketball know Tyler Hansbrough's the number is 50. And anyway, it's a pretty glorious thing, <laughs> Not, <laughs> that part of it. But, uh, well, I said, Chancellor, you know, if I'm going to do that, don't you think I ought to go to the game? <laughs> <laughs> and he, he said, oh, yes, I think we can manage that. And I said, <laughs> Well, it'd be my, nice if my wife came with me. <laughs> he said, well, we can do that too. And then, I'm, I'm, I'm really rolling now. <laughs> and I said, how am I going to get there? <laughs> <laughs> so we got on the athletics uh, uh, plane to go there, and we had a good time. Unfortunately, we lost on the first game, as too many of you know. Not, this is not going to happen this time. <laughs> I'm not going this time either, so I won't be a jinx. <laughs> so, so those of you who did not know uh, Professor Smithies before today, you can see that he's someone that's very approachable and <laughs> certainly is willing to discuss anything. So let me open it up to questions, and I guess we want to make sure that when we do that you speak into the microphone. So who has a question for, for our distinguished guests? Yes, in the back and fuel. 
And if you could also identify who you are and if you're a student or faculty member. My name is Anna Goldstein. I'm a second year graduate student in chemistry. Louder. I'm a second year graduate student in chemistry. And um, many of the papers and journals that I look up on SciFinder relating to my research end up being in Chinese or Russian or some other language that I don't speak. And I think previously that might have been the case with French or German. Um, so because communication and sharing is so important, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on the common language of science. Well, uh, when I was, uh, when I was um, a, a chemistry student, I, I did study chemistry as well as physiology. And, and uh, you had to learn German uh, and pass a German exam because at that time, most, at least of the organic chemistry uh, literature was in German. And um, uh, w one did it. It was a necessary thing. I, I think the, the matter-of-fact situation is now that English is the scientific language. And so that's what's happening. Um, nearly all of the important work is published in English or translated very quickly. So I don't, um, in a way, I, I don't know that I agree with you about a lot of them being in, in other languages. I've used SciFinder and I don't find all that many, but it may be our different things that we look at um, in that respect. But. It just happens to be the way life is, as it were, or, or how the world is, that uh, the language of, uh, of universal usage changes with power structures. So it was Latin. I suppose at one time it might have been Greek, but it was Latin for a long time. And then, and then you, you socially were inept if you didn't talk French. And, uh, and that goes back, of course, to the Norman Conquest, because the Norman, Normans conquered uh, England and, uh, and, uh, and brought with them the French language, which we see still in our language now. It's marvelous, I always think, to, to realize why we talk about beef and mutton. And we talk about beef because boeuf is a French for cow, and mouton is a French for a sheep. And so they, uh, when it was on the table, the aristocracy only talked about cow and, and, um, uh, and uh, pig, pork, and uh, 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 sheep in their language, which was French. So languages go with power. And I don't know how long we'll last in English. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's open for questions. Actually, here in the oh. second row, sorry. Um, Diane Ward, um, faculty nutrition. Um, over your career, I'm sure you've seen some groundbreaking discoveries in science. What, what do you think are the um, major groundbreaking discoveries that you've seen, and what do you see coming ahead? Well, you know, they, the groundbreaking ones just keep coming, don't they? I mean, uh, I mentioned I mentioned Watson Crick, but uh, you can go back uh, 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 almost a generation, in fact, at least a generation. Uh, when I was a student, I remember our professor coming in one day and I'm very excited and say, it's just been discovered that DNA is the genetic material. See, it wasn't known what the, the DNA was the genetic material. So that was a groundbreaking thing. Uh, came out, and then the Watson Crick thing was very groundbreaking. Uh, I remember the first time it was possible to sequence DNA, and that was enormously exciting. Because I went to this meeting, and um, a young graduate student, Na uh, Nancy Maisel, g gave the talk. And she got up, and she started on the blackboard, and she wrote down 60 letters, and that was the sequence of, the, of DNA uh, in from the bacterium E. coli between the the gene she was studying, which was beta galactosidase, which was a protein that makes uh, the, the protein enzyme, 
and the controlling sequence, which was upstream, the, the so-called um, operator. And um, this sequence, uh, was uh, she just wrote it down. Of course, we couldn't tell whether she'd written the real one down. She could have written 60 letters of any sort, and we wouldn't have known. <laughs> uh, uh, but she wrote that down. It was very exciting, and I thought, now I want to do that for a human gene, for two human genes. And that got me started in doing work on, with DNA and sequencing. Of course, I had no idea how difficult the problem was, or I might not have done it. <laughs> uh, it was much more difficult, and it didn't mean anything when you got it. You didn't understand what you'd got, you see. So, but there was, that was, there was a world-breaking thing. And if I could tell you what the future was, I would be doing it. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question, if I may, uh, kind of a follow-up to, to the earlier one. Uh, how has collaboration in science changed over the course of your career, and does the availability of so much more information online have anything to do with that? Oh, I, th I don't think collaboration in science has changed. I think it's very good in general. I think people collaborate uh, readily and easily most of the time. If you get somebody c comes to you and says, "I would, l for example, I'd like to use something that you've made," uh, and uh, the, if, if you've already made it and published it, it's your um, uh, understood obligation to give it without return. In other words, you don't get authorship or anything. And we do that all the time. If you haven't yet published it, then there is an implicit agreement, which is it's a better stated explicitly, uh, to, sh to, um, uh, to collaborate and publish together. Um, but the collaborations are always enjoyable. If, if you remember the golden rule, which is when you think about the collaboration, you don't think about yourself. You think about your collaborator. You always think about what is in it for you, looking at the collaborator. Because it, it will take care of yourself, all right. But if you think about what's in it for your collaborator, you will have a happy collaboration. And, and most of mine have been lifelong and, and most enjoyable. I had a, a lovely one um, in relation to the, uh, to the genes which uh, affect uh, blood pressure and have other side effects. And this uh, uh, scientist in France, uh, uh, P P Pierre, uh, Francois, uh, Francois, um, what? Francois? Oh, yeah, Francois Alain Gillard. Uh, he wrote to me and said, yeah, I would like to have your mice to do an experiment uh, because I'd made some mice that, in which the, this particular gene that he was interested in varied in, in the level of expression. So I had mice that had less than normal, normal or more than normal. And I sent these mice to him and he did work with them. And we published a paper together which, was, which was, uh, led to some interesting thing. But I never met him. And then I uh, had to give a talk in, in um, New York, and I knew he was coming to the meeting, and but I, I, I got up and I gave my talk, and I, said, and I got to the part where, and, and I have this uh, marvelous collaboration with this, this Francois Alain Jules, but I've, I've never met him. <laughs> and, and a guy at the back of the room got up and... <laughs> <laughs> And then later, when we visited France, and we and I visited France, he turns out he's, he's lived all his life in Paris. And so he took us on a, on, on a self-driven tour of Paris in the evening. He knew how to get through all the traffic and all the places. It was a marvelous ride. That's almost as good as the NCAAs. That's right. <laughs> So collaborations have been a joy for me. Uh, I've had many, and uh, there are, I don't think there's a single one that's ended it up in a problem. There's one that I miss that I always regret. That there's one where I was given some samples of serum, and in the early days, and and I didn't think that. Uh, and I did a lot of work with them, and then contacted other people and and worked out some genetic thing. But the person who first given me that sample, I should have had his name on my paper. He should have been a collaborator. And I missed it. And I wrote to him, I, when he wrote to me when I got the Nobel Prize, and I wrote to him saying, ah, now I can contact you and I can tell you how, how, 
how sorry I am that I didn't include you in that paper because that's the, one of the few ones that I can remember not doing what I would have liked. I didn't realize it, you know, he should have said. But uh, that's collaboration. It's a joy, it's a collaboration. I don't think it's changed at all uh, since uh, uh, the explosion of things. But do you think the internet connectivity we have has made it somewhat easier to communicate with scientists in other places? I don't use the internet to communicate. <laughs> I, you, you're asking the wrong I know person. that. <laughs> I, don't even do e I don't even do email. I never did mail either. <laughs> I mean, I, I, a mail would come and I would open it and, uh, and then think I might reply to it one day. And uh, I remember coming across the one when I was in the early days of starch gel electrophoresis when somebody wrote to me and and I, and, I, and I came across this letter and, and, he'd, and in it he'd said, uh, I, I'm hoping to come and visit you um, uh, and uh, that you will show me various things. And that was a week after he said he was going to come and I'd never replied. <laughs> and so I thought, oh dear. And so I, I wrote her a nice polite letter uh, saying that I was sorry that I hadn't replied to his letter. And it please d do feel that you can come, you know. And he wrote back and said, but I came. <laughs> <laughs> and you showed me everything I wanted to see. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. <laughs> but that, and, oh, there's a couple of other, there's some correspondence uh, that I wish I'd g g still got the copy of. There was one in the early days of, uh, of uh, when we didn't understand that, that you have to be very careful when studying families about what information you give back to the family because sometimes it, it can be embarrassing for the family. And there was one family where, where the <coughs> blood groups showed uh, that there was a case of non-paternity almost certainly and, and we didn't want to upset the family and so uh, we wrote to uh, uh, the person who had done the blood groups for us and said oh his name was Bruce John Bruce for goodness sake just help us to uh, respond to this question without upsetting the family and he wrote back a long, complicated letter. And there was, was no Xeroxing available, of course, at that time. It was a carbon copy I had of a, uh, with a, a typewriter with a carbon. And, and um, it highly involved about uh, sometimes blood groups don't show the way they were really inherited, etc., etc., etc. And And he sent me a copy at the bottom in his handwriting. He'd written, and you know, Oliver, it might even be true. <laughs> <laughs> Question in the back. Right. Hi, my name is Yi Zhou Dong, a 30 year graduate student from School of Pharmacy. I have a question about the grant. We know faculty member has to apply for a grant uh, to do research. Some faculty member like to publish more papers to apply for more grants, and some faculty like to uh, do real science, they think, and uh, publish better papers. Do you have any comments about that? Thank well, you. I think I probably belong to the second group, and they don't get funded as easily <laughs> as the first group. I, I don't think there is any, any, unfortunately, there's no simple answer to that question. I, I think uh, you have to do what you have to do, as it were. Uh, and I can't write trivial papers. I find it, uh, they're not enjoyable, and I... I, I and so I tend to publish in, uh, relatively infrequently. And uh, I don't do better at getting grants than most other people. I don't think I, I mean, I have one that I was uh, telling Tori about that uh, I applied for about uh, or two and a half years ago with my kidney work. I had this glorious hypothesis, and you see, and, and I have applied for a grant that's called an R21, which is where you can try something that's way out and, and you don't have to have preliminary data or anything. So I sent this in and it got turned around, no preliminary data. <laughs> You're not supposed to have preliminary data for that. So that's what happened to that one. So then I wrote, uh, I, I got preliminary data. And now this is after I got the Nobel Prize. And I sent it in with a, uh, answering all the questions with the preliminary data. And now they didn't like the hypothesis. <laughs> So I didn't get it either way. So I'm afraid it happens to all of us. And I don't know, there's no answer that's simple. 
you just do the best you can and you do the way you want to do science and it's better to write good papers infrequently than poor papers frequently um, but um, you have to have some sort of compromise in order to survive Excuse me. I don't mean this respectfully but uh, disrespectfully but I'm wondering if the knockout gene business that you've been involved with and so successful and is kind of coming to uh, an end or is going to be uh, over within well, the next I, 10 I, years or so. Yeah, I would hope it would come to an end in a sense that people will find better ways of doing things because that's what science is. It always progresses and um, I think it's had rather a long life. I'm surprised really because we published our first mm, paper showing that it was possible in 1985 and so that's 20 years ago and the first animals in about 1989 so that's that's still uh, 90 that's uh, well 19 years ago isn't it or whatever and still people are doing it and in fact they but uh, i i think it's much more advanced than knocking out uh, i like to to uh, make the the comparison that we don't we di we all differ we you just look around and you can see we're all different and that's exciting and interesting and we have different susceptibilities to various conditions especially as we get older they show more um, but these aren't due to knockout of anything uh, because if they were knockout, they would be relatively simple to discover because they would be inherited in a simple manner. Recessive is what geneticists call it, where you get one bad copy from one parent, one bad copy from another, and if you are then the unlucky person, you get two bad copies and the gene doesn't work. <laughs> and um, uh, But uh, most of the conditions that are, uh, that are uh, common, like... Uh, high blood pressure and atherosclerosis and arthritis or whatever you might think, they're, diabetes even, um, they're, they aren't inherited simply. So they're more complicated. So there's a lot more to do than just knocking out genes. And uh, I think there's still a hope, but there's still a, f a phase for doing that. But it's much too difficult still. <coughs> and so I hope somebody will make it a lot easier and then I will be passé. <laughs> <laughs> no. Thank you. Uh, I'm one, uh, my name is Xu Min, one of the cardiology fellow. Um, your, my question is opposite of the another extreme of your uh, the the previous question so your technique if you combine with embryonic stem cells basically provide a way to manipulate all the genomes do you have any concerns of biosafety and uh, ethic in your back in the back of your mind well i think the safety side of it is uh, you must mean as far as uh, being safe when it applied to humans. Is that what I'm hearing, really? Because there is no indication that uh, that uh, uh, an altered animal would take over the world or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I think you must mean that. And, and that also raises the ethical question. So, um, well, first of all, I'll, I'll say a word or two about embryonic stem cells. And I... I, th I think it, it's probably n not very important anymore, but um, there have been, a, there've been ethical considerations uh, that mm, various uh, pe people have about whether you would, can make an embryonic stem cell because you're destroying life. And I, my uh, uh, response to that is that it's the wrong way around, that the people who worry about it uh, have, have got the situation inverted. That in fact, life began, and whether you think it began uh, through some strange accident of the universe, or whether you think uh, that some higher being first started life, life began many uh, millions of years ago, and it's been one continuous stream ever since. And when we have a uh, fertilized egg, for example, that's still alive. 
and when you make an embryonic stem cell from it, it's still alive. If that embryonic stem cell is used to help somebody, it's never lost its life. Its life was perpetuated. If you throw it away, you destroyed life. So that's my feeling about the ethics of embryonic stem cells. As far as the ethics are concerned about trying to alter genes in humans, I would say by all means alter genes in humans who have faulty genes that can be corrected as a, an individual. That's to say, if I have, as, as I originally set out to do, if I have an individual who has uh, sickle cell anemia and I know what is the gene that is wrong, if I can find a way to correct that gene for that person, there is no ethical problem whatsoever in that. But now if you ask me to correct that gene in order that their children would not ha inherit you know, that difference, I would say that it gets to be much more difficult. First of all, it's extremely difficult to do that. It's very inefficient and it's full of all sorts of risks if you were to, to attempt it. So I would say it's completely unethical to attempt to do that. It's also unnecessary because you can avoid that problem in a different way. You can avoid it and uh, by uh, selection of embryos because we can type uh, an embryo nowadays uh, to uh, determine its genetic constitution. So if there is a condition which is inherited uh, one, uh, and the family wishes to do this, they can have uh, embryos which are generated from the sperm and the egg of, uh, of the par parents involved and, and they can be tested to make sure that the ones that are implanted to develop into a baby are not the ones carrying the defective gene. So it's a very eminently a approachable problem in, by selection, not by altering a gene, which is way too risky. And as far as trying to do anything to make a super person, well, it's pie in the sky anyway. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's, it, it's, it's going back to the days of Nazi Germany where they were trying to pr produce superhumans by their perfect Aryan, you know. I mean, it's just not. I don't need to go on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hi, yes, Lisa, my name is Zhao. I think uh, I'm a postdoc. I, I won't take the opportunity to ask you what's your opinions for postdocs. <laughs> what's my opinion for postdocs? Well, I've wor I, I work with postdocs all, all the time. I mean, I think my opinion of them depends on the postdoc. <laughs> 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 and I'm not quite really understanding your question. I mean, what's my opinion on postdocs? Do I think they're a good thing? Is yeah, that what you're asking? Yeah, that guideline, like, uh, what hmm? you should do for a project. How do you pick a project or something? Oh, how do I pick projects? Well, usually the postdocs pick the problems. <laughs> Uh, no, I don't get many people applying. Actually, <laughs> I don't. Uh, I'm, I was rather surprised. I thought maybe uh, once I got this uh, little thing that uh, <laughs> people would apply, but I haven't had any more people applied than the, uh, applied in the past. I think they think I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> Far That's from it. Oh, I do have a real story about that because my first paper was with my scientific with my tutor when I was a student. I was still a, a student and, and we wrote a paper together because of some idea I had which I knew was wrong and I didn't know why it was wrong and I asked him why it was wrong and it took a whole paper to decide why it was wrong. But we published this and, and that was in 1948. Now about 30 years ago, uh, then that would be 1978, you see, uh, then somebody came up to me and said, are you, the, are you that Smithies? Uh, who published that article in Physiological Reviews. And, and I said, uh, yeah, yes, I am. He said, oh, I thought you were dead. <laughs> <laughs> so I think they think that way about postdoc. <laughs> Any other questions? Here's one. My name is Rita McFadden. I'm a first-year graduate student in oral biology. And something that you said about your first literature search in insulin kind of struck me, because I find myself in 
a similar situation, and I was wondering if you have any advice on how to grow as a scientist more efficiently, how to not be overwhelmed with all the literature that's out there, and how to know that your ideas aren't too crazy and complicated and all that. Well, to some, some extent, not knowing everything is valuable because you don't know what doesn't work. <laughs> and therefore, you, don't, uh, you aren't inhibited by trying something new. So there's a fine line between knowing everything and not knowing enough. Uh, if, if you read, I think you obviously have to read the literature enough to understand what's going on. And you have to read the literature enough to think about something interesting to do. And then, I, uh, and then if nobody has done it, I wouldn't worry about whether anybody thinks it can be done. I think I would try to do it, as it were. So uh, there isn't, uh, as usual, there's no easy answer to these questions. But when I was uh, reading the stuff on the kidney I was telling you about, I mean, I just found that reading one paper led me back to another, back to another, and that was exciting. Uh, and uh, if I found that they were saying things that I didn't agree with, I would disregard it. <laughs> <laughs> I would know it, but I could say, I'm not going to worry about that. <laughs> and so you have to sort of, I think you have to w wing it a bit, you know. You have to uh, say, I I I'd like to do this. Is there any good reason why I shouldn't? And there usually isn't. So do what then, do the thing that you want to do. Uh, I, I, I look back in the insulin one, what I, w I found out was that they made the insulin by extracting it with, from pancreas with hydrochloric acid and ethanol. And I decided no self-respecting protein could stand that. <laughs> and, and so there must be a precursor. And I began to look for a precursor. And uh, I never found it. Uh, but there is one, in fact. <coughs> But so you, you, you can do things for the wrong reason. <coughs> but do good experiments. And keep good records. And keep good records, yeah. Uh, my name is So Young Eun from microbiology and immunology. And um, I was hoping that somebody would just ask this question, but nobody did. So <laughs> um, the question is. Uh, a bit uh, louder. Yeah. yeah. The question is how you manage the difficult time of not being able to produce your data that you are expecting or, I mean, I mean any kind of, um, you know, the final um, outcome. Um, and it's because I, I think that it's really crucial to um, determine at some point whether you pursue and uh, keep pursuing this project or just uh, drop it and move on. So I, I just want, I mean, thinking, I mean, regarding your uh, work on uh, gene targeting, it took like three years um, to get the, the final data. And um, I'm just, I, I really um, would like to hear about your. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so your question is really, to, uh, it's uh, when, how long do you go on doing something when it doesn't work? When do you quit and when do you, or whatever? And, I think it depends on the level of uh, of, of the failure. I mean, it, no, I'm I'm quite serious I, 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 in that. I, and what I mean is, if you're trying to do make, make a certain part of your experiment work, and it doesn't work, and it's a many, it's a specific step, as it were, uh, that you have, you can probably go on, maybe you spend a couple of weeks, three weeks, maybe a couple of months, and then you say, well, I better use a different method, but you're still trying to do the same thing. And then so you change your method and try to do it a different way, and you might do that for another two or three months. And then, you, and then if it's not showing any sign of working, you begin to ask, well, is it ever going to be possible to do what I want to do? And maybe I should start to do something else. And that's a different level of decision, isn't it? Because 
One is how often you repeat an experiment. Well, obviously, you repeat it until you're sure you're doing it properly. And then how much do you try changing it or going to a variant? Then that depends on what else is available and how, and how important that particular problem is. Can you go around it? Um, but then finally, you're going to have to decide, is the overall goal worth it? And maybe it isn't worth it and you quit. And, or maybe you get depressed. And that <laughs> happens to all of us. And uh, uh, yeah, there are there are several sorts of remedies. Uh, <laughs> one, of course, is to drink yourself into a stupor. <laughs> <laughs> I don't recommend that. And I've never tried it. <laughs> but uh, the other thing is to go away for go on vacation or something, and go and do something different. And you come back energized, and, and that happened in the gene targeting with me that everything didn't seem like it was working and, and my graduate student in, uh, at the time didn't want to work on it anymore and, and my postdocs weren't keen either and, um, because we'd thought of so many things why, why it could go wrong. And I went off with my friends. We went sailing and flying and sailing and I came back and I, and I thought, I'm going to start again with a different, slightly different approach. And, started again and, and it worked then. So you get refurbished by going and doing something else. So it's important not to just have science as your only thing. You should have at least uh, have a hobby and, and it's very nice to have a companion that you're fond of. And uh, then if you have a, a happy companion and, and, uh, uh, and a hobby, then you've got three things and you can afford one of them to go wrong occasionally. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> may, maybe even two. <laughs> but so th those are things that help. Knowing that one of your hobbies is flying, we're hoping that's not one of the things that goes wrong for you anytime soon. <laughs> well, you, you know there will be a day when you shouldn't do it anymore. <laughs> Um, so considering all the varied backgrounds that there are, in, oh, my name is Leslie. I'm a staff member in uh, Lineberger Cancer um, Center. Um, so considering all the people with all the varied backgrounds in here, like what advice do you have as far as um, maybe a theme or um, a quote or something that has encouraged you like throughout your scientific journey? Well, I think, uh, I think that... Um, just the the whole of the discipline of science has always in, uh, been part of my life, as it were, and that's what's encouraged me. And it, it, it I didn't realize it was what you call science when I first began. I just wanted to be an inventor. I I read uh, I think I read a comic strip with a, that had this character in it that was an inventor, and, and he always seemed to be doing neat things. And I thought I'll be I want to be an inventor. I didn't know the word scientist, and uh, and then I found that I like making things and doing things and building things with my, with my hands and make a you try to make a, a radio or you make a telescope or whatever, and uh, so you find uh, something that you enjoy doing, and that turns out to be science really because. Um, at the time I went to the university, I couldn't decide what I wanted to study, whether I, I won my scholarship with physics, but I don't know where in my mind I decided I, I might want to be a, 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 um, a medical doctor. And so I eventually uh, started off as a medical student and, uh, and did that for two, three years and, and then heard uh, from the, the person I mentioned, my tutor, who was so exciting a person and his things were so exciting, I decided that I wanted to do that sort of science, which meant learning chemistry, which uh, we were talking to that young lady over there about chemistry. And uh, I went and did chemistry and it was always something exciting, you know, and so, uh, so that's the enjoyment of science is that it never stops being exciting. Because you don't know what's, um, as I say it uh, in, in a way here, I mean, this is my book, uh, and uh, the, this is page uh, 59 in this book. And this, I'm here. It's page 60. I don't know what's on it. I don't know what's going to be on it. 
That's why it's exciting. Because mm -hmm. I don't know what's going to be on it. Mm -hmm. Very good. I think with that we have certainly enjoyed the time very much with you, Oliver. Let me thank you on behalf of all the people here. Thank you.